23 verses 1 through 12. So if you've been with us over the past several weeks or if you've been following along on, online or whatever you've been uh, doing there, if you've been keeping up with us, you know that we have been examining Jesus' interaction with the religious leaders of the first century. And this section uh, began as they were asking him questions. This previous section began as they were asking him questions in an attempt to trap him in his words. And we saw how they were unable to trap him in his words. He was sort of revealing the, the uh, greatness of divine wisdom as he was showing them or as he was showing them a different way. He wasn't allowing himself to be trapped in his words. He was sort of taking them beyond what their understanding was currently and placing it even farther than what they could have imagined. Uh, paying taxes to Caesar was one of those things. They thought that they would be able to trap him either with the Jews or the Romans, but he showed that honoring God and honoring government are not mutually exclusive, right? We saw as the Sadducees tried to trap him with the question of the resurrection, and he showed that it was because they did not know the power of God nor the Scriptures that they would even ask such a question that life would be drastically different in the next, the next life than it is here. And of course we saw him as he was asked about the greatest commandment, said it is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And then last week we saw as Jesus turned and then he asked them a question, a question that they refused to answer, right? One they answered insufficiently and one they refused to answer. They, he was asking them, who do you say the Christ is? And they saw it only from an earthly perspective, his human lineage, if you would, from the line of David. And that was an insufficient Answer, And then he pressed them farther to ask them, how could it be then that the Christ is also David's Lord? And they refused to answer because they knew that by answering they would be sort of implicating themselves in this willful or woeful unbelief. But we talked about last week how this is the most important question that anyone could answer. What do you believe about the Messiah? In fact, if you get that wrong, then you miss heaven. If you get that wrong, you don't have a relationship with Christ. If you get that wrong, you are an idolater. This week is going to sort of begin a new section where Jesus is going to launch out in this full-on assault against the scribes and Pharisees. And it is connected to the previous section. Jesus has just told them, or sort of reminded them, that they do not believe in Him as the Messiah, as the Son of the living God, how Peter had confessed earlier in the Gospel of Matthew. So it's sort of connected here, but it sort of changes where he is going to sort of launch it first into this discussion or this warning where he's going to warn his disciples and the crowds about the Pharisees and then he's going to pronounce these seven woes on the scribes and Pharisees in a very Old Testament prophetic way. And so we understand that they're rejecting Jesus as the Messiah and their attempt to gain this righteous standing before God based on their works is something that Jesus is denouncing with the utmost, with the utmost importance. And we're going to break this section into two parts. And I think it does that rather neatly. It goes to verses 1 through 12 and then 13 through the rest. And we're going to see in this first section that Jesus is going to be addressing the disciples and the crowds, and the second he's going to be pronouncing these woes. Now, one of the things that we need to keep in the forefront of our minds is that within each of us, there is a tendency that if left unchecked, we will behave the same way as the Pharisees and the scribes. I want to say that again because we tend to throw stones at them, but I want to remind you, Christian, that in your heart, if left unchecked, you will respond or you will react or you will act in such a way that would put you in the same camp as the Pharisees and the scribes. Listen, we are all prone to legalism. All of us. All of us are prone. If we do not daily preach the gospel to ourselves, all of us are prone to sort of thinking that somehow we are meriting God's favor, or we are working to keep or to establish our salvation, we will turn ourselves into little legalists. In fact, I would say all of us are recovering legalists. And so we need the gospel. But not only are we prone to turn to legalism, which we'll define here in a moment, you know as well as I do that if we don't guard our hearts, we are all prone to man-pleasing. We will do things for the sole purpose of making sure that everyone else knows how good we are. 
rather than doing things for the glory of God. So we don't need to push this only on the Pharisees and the scribes. We need to allow the scripture to act as a mirror, to reflect in us those parts of our hearts that Jesus would warn do not need to be there. And we need to, at the end of this section, be reminded of who we are and how we are to operate as the people of God. So let's read Matthew chapter 23, verses 1 through 12, and then we'll begin to walk through it. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The scribes and Pharisees sit on Moses' seat, so do and observe whatever they tell you, but not the works that they do. For they preach, but do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. They do all their deeds to be seen by others. For they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long, and they love the place of honor at feasts and the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by others. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher, and you are all brothers. And call no man your father on earth, for you have one father who is in heaven. Neither be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Christ. The greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Let's pray and ask God's blessing and assistance on His Word this morning. Our Father in Heaven, we come to You with our Bibles open. And Father, we pray that You would open our hearts and minds to behold wondrous things from Your Word. God, this morning we come to You understanding and knowing that we are a people who are prone to wander. We are a people who are prone to rebellion. And Father, we pray that through this text that You would... Remind us of those areas of our own lives as the Scripture searches our hearts in the power of your Holy Spirit. Remind us of those places where we would be walking according to the Pharisees and scribes. Father, we pray that you would forgive us our sins, forgive our trespasses, cleanse our hearts and minds. Father, show us the better way, the way of the disciples of Christ. Father, this morning we pray that your word would cause your will to be done in each one of our lives. And God, this morning we pray that you would transform us by the renewing of our minds, according to your word and the power of your spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Alright, so the first thing that I want us to see, and I think it would help us to understand, is who are the scribes and the Pharisees, right? They are a group that we have been encountering all throughout the Gospel of Matthew. But it really hasn't been clearly defined who these two groups were. I think you've probably been able to reason from the arguments that Jesus is having with them, at least the problems in their theology. But we need to understand sort of what their function was and where they came from as this people who were religious leaders of the day. So the scribes were experts in the Old Testament law. They studied the law, they copied the law, and they provided comments or commentaries on the law. These were those whose job it was to preserve and protect the Old Testament. And they took their job very seriously. They would even count, after they finished writing a section of Scripture, they would count the spaces and they would count the letters to make sure that every single copy of God's Word was correct in what they had written down. They were people who really protected and provided for the people the law of God. Now, who were the Pharisees? Well, the Pharisees were a group that originated at some point during the 400-year period that we know or we call the intertestamental period or the period between the Testaments. We don't know the exact date that they came into being, but we know that they originated sometime in the intertestamental period. They were members of a religious sect that were devoted to promoting and protecting the law of God. They arose in part to combat the spread of the Greek culture that was brought on by Alexander the Great's program of Hellenization. So they were, in many ways, trying to protect the people of God from secular society. And at the beginning, they were devout men of faith. They were people who really loved and worshipped God. But you know how things go. As generations came and went, they became more and more self-righteous and hypocritical. And if you think about it, these people, the scribes and the Pharisees, who 
were protecting the law of God, who were protecting the culture of the people of God, these should have been the ones who were ushering people into the kingdom of God, bringing them to the Messiah for salvation. But instead they were acting as barriers. Now what is the problem with both of these groups? Because both of these groups fundamentally had a very similar problem. The first is, is that they were hypocritical. The second is they were legalists. And both of them together were opposed to the one whom God sent to be the king, the Messiah, King Jesus. So then we have to define our terms here. Who or what is a hypocrite? Well, a hypocrite is someone who acts in a way that is not true to who they are. In the first century, someone who was a hypocrite was an actor who would wear a mask so that way he could play the part of another person. And this is largely the way that we understand someone who is a hypocrite as well. Someone who is not acting out of the truest, the truest part of who they actually are. They're putting on a show for everyone else. They were also legalists. What is a legalist? Well, a legalist, if you wanted to sort of sum it up in its most condensed form, a legalist is someone who tries to work their way to a righteous standing before God. That's the easiest way to think about them. Legalists, they use the law. They try to work their way to a righteous standing before God. Something that, by the way, is absolutely impossible. Now, this is different than manifesting holiness because of our righteous standing before God in Christ Jesus. Remember, Peter in 1 Peter, quoting from the Old Testament, tells us that we are to be holy even as He is holy. So some would say, well, that's legalism. No, that's different. You see, there is a marked difference in trying to work your way to a righteous standing before God and being righteous out of your righteous standing before God. What I mean is this. The first... It's trying to do works as a means of salvation. So if I do enough X, Y, and Z, I will be saved. The latter is doing good works that flow from their salvation and union with Christ. If you wanted to think about it as two pyramids, maybe this would help to put a picture in your mind. The legalist would have the pyramid upside down. They would do all of these works trying to reach a point of salvation. Whereas the Christian would flip the pyramid right side up and say, no, no, we have a point of salvation and from that point flow all of our good works. One, the upside down one, is a way for you to land yourself in hell. The other is the way that you are to follow and to be in union with Jesus Christ. You see, our union with Jesus Christ, the point of the pyramid, is what, is what produces all of our good works. This is what Jesus says, is it not, in John chapter 15, that He is the vine and we are the branches? That so long as we are united to Him by faith, we will produce good works. You see, the point of the pyramid flows into good works, not good works flowing into salvation. And even with all of these problems, I think that the disciples probably would have this temptation to sort of try to mimic what they have seen all of their lives in the lives of the Pharisees and the scribes. Even with all of the problems that Jesus is pointing out in the religious leaders of the day, He's warning the crowds and disciples, don't be like them. Don't be like them. You say, well, why would they want to mimic them? Well, think about it. These were the only religious leaders that they had ever known. These Pharisees and scribes, they presented themselves as pious. That means deeply devoted to their religion. They were religious and they appeared to be religious experts. Not only that, but they were also something akin to sort of religious celebrities of the day. They were super influential in the culture, and they sat in positions of power and authority. And so think about it. If you had only known one type of religious leader for your entire life, wouldn't it be a temptation for you to slowly fall back in to what they had taught the early parts of your life, it would. In Martin Luther's day, after he had sort of boldly proclaimed this, we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, according to Scripture alone, right for the glory of God alone. Even his own church, towards the end, started to fall back and started to go back to the Catholicism of their day. They started to go back to worshiping or trying to find their salvation in, in relics and in doing these religious works. 
You see, it's very easy for us to fall into the only thing that we have ever seen and known. And Jesus is warning his disciples, do not be like them. So this message is going to have two points. Don't be like them and do be different. And so we're going to see this as we start through this. So the first thing is, he tells them in verse, verses 1 through 7, don't be like them. Don't be like them. Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the scribes and Pharisees sit on Moses' seat, so do and observe whatever they tell you, but not the works they do. For they preach, but they don't practice. They tie up heavy burdens that are hard to bear. They lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. They do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long. They love the place of honor at feasts and the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by others. So the first part of this, Jesus tells them that they do sit on the seat of Moses or on Moses' seat. So do and observe what they tell you. Now, Jesus is telling them here that they are sitting upon Moses' seat. Now, Moses' seat probably should be understood metaphorical, as in those who were in the line of Moses, those who were interpreters of the law of God. But they know from excavations that there actually was a chair within the synagogues that people would sit, and it was a position of authority, and it stood for those who were worthy to interpret the Torah or the Old Testament, the law of God. And so Jesus tells them they do sit on Moses' seat, so do what they teach, but don't do what they do. Now some see in this a sort of sarcasm. D.A. Carson sees it this way, sort of like, do what they tell you to do if you want to, but let me tell you what they're really like. And that's possible, but I don't feel it here in this text, and I could be wrong, but I think that Jesus is telling them to do what they say insofar as their words accord with the law or the word of God. Surely Jesus does not mean do everything that they tell you to do. Think about it. He has spent the vast majority of his interactions with the religious leaders pointing out how wrong they are when they have added to God's word. In Matthew 15, 6, he says, For the sake of your tradition, you have made void the word of God, you hypocrites. So Jesus surely doesn't mean follow everything that they teach. He just wants to tell them to, teach, to obey everything they teach when it accords with the Word of God. But I do want to say one thing about this verse before we move into this warning that Jesus gives to His disciples and to the crowds. And that is, a hypocritical teacher does not make void the truths of God's Word. I want to say that again. A hypocritical teacher does not make void the truths of God's Word. I, I hear this from time to time. People will say, I don't believe what they say because so-and-so acts this way or that way. I'm sure you've heard the same thing. I'm not going to be a Christian. I don't listen to Christians because they don't act like X, Y, and Z. Do you know how foolish that is to say? That means that you are basing your truth or the truthfulness of the Bible, of God's Word, based on the actions of a person that may or may not be born again. How many times in your life are you going to believe that something can't be true because somebody is acting a certain way? That would be foolishness. Foolishness. For us to frame all of what we believe as truth based on the actions of sinful people. God's Word is true not because someone, someone's life lives up to the ideals presented in it. Do you understand that? God's Word is true no matter if any of us live up to the ideals presented in it. It is true because it proceeds from the one who is truth. And it contains no error. And since it is true, it contains no error. It is authoritative. I hope that you understand that. He then goes on to tell them, They preach but do not practice. But not the works they do, for they preach but don't practice. Listen, let's just be honest. It's a lot easier to tell others what God expects of them than it is to live your faith day in and day out. Let's just be honest. 
It's really easy for us to look at other people and tell them everywhere that they're messing up. It's not as easy to live out the claims of Scripture or to live out the commands of Scripture, is it? But I want you to see in this that God cares much more about the holiness of our lives than He does about the depth of our theological insights. Listen, for those of us who are born again, it is not an option for us to live lives of holiness. Think about it. God empowers our obedience, our desire for obedience. God empowers our desire for obedience, and God empowers our obedience. One of the promises of the new covenant, Jeremiah 31, Ezekiel 36, is that God would write the law upon our hearts. He would fill us with His Spirit so that way we would be careful to do all the things that He has commanded of us. He changes our heart, which changes our desires. So God empowers our desire for obedience. So every time you desire to do what God commands of you, you need to send up a praise to God because that's not coming from your flesh. It's coming from the work of the Holy Spirit. But God empowers our obedience as well. He gave us His Spirit so that we can walk according to the Spirit, so that we can be set free from the law written in stone. We don't need it because we are led by the Spirit of God. But I'll tell you this, God also expects our obedience. He empowers our desire for it, He empowers us to live it, and He expects obedience from us. There is a certain form of Christianity in America that floats around all over the place. And the technical word for it is antinomianism. It means against the law. Basically, it's easy believism. I can say a few words, and then God doesn't care what I do for the rest of my life. I can live however I want to, and God's not going to be bothered by it because I said a few words at one time at the front of a church. That is not biblical Christianity. It's not. The fact is, if there's no fruit in your life, if there's no desire for obedience, if you're not walking in fellowship with God, and I don't mean perfectly, I mean it all, then you're not a Christian. There's really no way around it. So we as the people of God must be careful to apply the truths and commands of Scripture to our own lives, not just to the lives of others. This is what the Pharisees did. They would stand and they would proclaim the law of God. God says you need to. And they didn't do it. They didn't do it. That is the definition of a hypocrite. Saying one thing, living another way. And I'll tell you, Jesus loves us enough to save us right where we are, but he loves us too much to leave us there. So if you're a Christian and you're not walking in obedient fellowship with Him, then you are walking in sin. Sin. Not mistake, sin. You are acting as a hypocrite. And if this is the, mean, the measure of your whole life from the point of your salvation until now, no fruit, no obedience, no desire to do what God commands of you, you really, really, really need to search your heart and make sure that you were ever born again at all. The second thing is, not only do they preach, but don't practice. They bind up or tie up heavy burdens hard to bear, lay them on people's shoulders, but they, are, they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. They place burdens on people's back, and they don't lift a finger to help them or lift a finger themselves at all. Now, in the first century context, it was common for people to place heavy loads on animals and have them carry them, carry them from place to place. However, if the load wasn't balanced just right, or it was a load that was too heavy for the animal to bear, the trip would end in catastrophe. And this is what Jesus is saying that the Pharisees are doing to people. Think about this. They, they, they not only applied the law of God to, to the people, right, to the people's lives, they also added commands to the law as a sort of fence around the law to keep people from breaking it. So not only did you have the burden of God's law, but you also had the burden of the traditions of the Pharisees and the scribes. You had this whole set of religious works that you had to keep, otherwise they said you were breaking the commands of God, which is what Jesus was telling them, you have made void the word of God to keep your traditions. They added all kinds of things. Think about it. This made living a life of faith and faithful obedience to God a thing that was virtually impossible. Virtually impossible. Can you imagine all of this burden on your back? It's impossible for you to do what the religious leaders are telling you that God requires of you to do. Not only that, 
But they had no paradigm. No paradigm. They had no structure in place for people to have the burden of the law lifted off their backs. They had no paradigm for that. They refused to lift a finger to point them to God's grace. They were pointing them to the law, but they never pointed to God's grace. They were, they were rejecting the only means to be set free from the law and the ways of sin. Do you see that? Placing burdens on people's back and then rejecting the Messiah? They were pointing them to the law, but they refused to point them to God's grace. Can you imagine if someone came to you, you're already guilty, you're already, your conscience is bothering you. That's why you're going to the religious leaders. Can you imagine if someone came to you, presented to you the law of God, showed you everywhere you fell short, then added more commands to it, and then just walked away? Can you imagine the burden? If someone just showed you the law of God, added commands to it, showed you everywhere you fell short, showed you that you were deserving of God's wrath, and then just walked away. Never pointing you to the one who came to grant peace with God and freedom from the law, from sin and death. Can you imagine the horror of that? By the way, the law was never meant to save anybody. It was never a means of salvation. It was always meant to reveal mankind's need for a Savior. Think about it. If the law was meant to be a means of salvation, then there would have been a no opportunity for atonement through the sacrificial system, which, of course, pointed to the once and final sacrifice for sin, Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. You see, the law was added so that way we would understand that we need a Savior. But from the very beginning, it has always been blood atonement that covered the sins of the people. Think about it in the Garden of Eden. The very first sin they committed. How did God say, you will come back to, to relationship with me? The seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. Then what did he do? He covered their sin, he covered their shame and their nakedness with the animal skins. Meaning he killed an animal so that their sin and shame could be covered. It's the same thing that's pictured in Abraham and Isaac. It's the same thing that is pictured every single day of atonement as the priest would sacrifice for the sins of the people. It's the same thing that we see in the sacrifice of Christ. Can you imagine this? Can you imagine the plight of the people under the, under the, the, the rulership or the, under the authority of the scribes and Pharisees? All law, no grace, no way. To be saved. Let's see what Paul says in Romans 3 24. By works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. Do you hear that? By works of the law, that means by your good works, no human being ever will be justified in his sight. It's impossible. This is God the Holy Spirit telling you, you cannot save yourself by your works. Since through the law comes knowledge of sin. That's what it is, it's a revealer. Of course, it also teaches us how God wants us to live our lives. It shows us what the life in Christ should look like. But principally, the law reveals our sinfulness. In Romans 3, he goes on and says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified by His grace as a gift. You see, that's the bad news and the good news of the gospel. The bad news is, is that all of us sin and fall short of the glory of God. All of us deserve eternal wrath, eternal damnation, eternal punishment under God's righteous wrath and hell. But the free gift of God is justification in Christ Jesus. Listen to this good news. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. He propitiated, He absorbed the wrath of God on, in our place so that we could be set free from the law of sin and death, so that we could be set free from eternal condemnation. Jesus is our only hope of salvation. And the Pharisees were rejecting Him outright. Listen, this is why Jesus tells us in Matthew 11, 28, 28 Come to Me. Come to Me. You see, the path to eternal life is not a path of works. It's a path towards a person. Come to me. 
All who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. You will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Can you imagine the salve to the wounds of the people under the authority of the scribes and Pharisees? All law, no grace. They pointed them to the law to show them where they were breaking God's commands. And Jesus says, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden. Come to me and I will remove the burden off your back. In Galatians 4, 4, Paul says the same thing. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. Look, I want you to consider this. When you tell a lost person they need to clean their life up, but you never point them to the only one who can save them, you are doing exactly what the Pharisees did. Exactly. Exactly. When someone comes to you and you only point them to the law of God, you're a sinner because of X, Y, and Z, but you never point them to Jesus. You're doing exactly what the Pharisees did. You know, when I hear this language of burdens on their back, I think about poor Christian in Pilgrim's Progress. As he is making his way, and he has this giant burden on his back, he has realized that he is a sinner. And this burden is weighing him down so much so that it's hard for him even to walk. He gets stuck in the slew of despond, right? He's stuck in this point of depression and despondency because of this great burden on his back. It's only whenever he comes to the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, the burden falls off and rolls down directly into the empty tomb. Some of you still have that burden on your back. Some of you are religious, but you are unsaved. And you walk around with a burden that is too heavy for anyone to bear. You walk around with this burden of guilt and shame before God. And that's why you come to church every Sunday. Because you want to have the burden removed. But you find the more you hear of God's word, the more burdened you become. Won't you stop being religious today and go to the only one who can remove the burden from your back? That's why Jesus came. He came to save sinners. He came to remove the burden. He came so that we can be reconciled to God. He's not like the Pharisees. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. But then he goes on and he says, They do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long. They practice their religious works to impress people, not God. That's the, the bottom dollar of what Jesus is saying here. It was a phylactery. A phylactery. A phylactery is a leather strip with pouch on it that would contain passages of scripture, like Exodus 13 or Deuteronomy 6. And why did they do it? Well, it was probably based on a literal understanding of Deuteronomy 11:18. You shall therefore lay up these words of mine in your heart and in your soul, and you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. The phylacteries weren't the problem. Many devout Jews would wear phylacteries in the hour of prayer. Whenever they would pray, they would wear phylacteries to remind them of the words of God. That's not the problem. The problem is they made theirs extra big, extra broad. And they didn't wear them just whenever they were praying. They would like to walk around with them, like, sun, like a sun visor over their head. Just walking around with these big phylacteries over their head. Can you imagine the foolish sight to see a bunch of people walking around with these huge, mongous billboard-looking things on their forehead? Now, it's not that big, but it was phylacteries on their forehead. But you know what it signifies to everyone? Oh, that guy. That guy is super religious. Look what he's doing. He's wearing that leather strap on his face. And on his hand. That guy. He's somebody. He's religious. And the Pharisees love it. That's why they did it. They didn't do it so that way they could remember the words of God in the Shema or Exodus 13. That's not why they did it. They did it so that way everyone else would say, look at that guy. Same thing with the tassels. The tassels were tassels that were sewn onto the corners of the garment, and it was a reminder to keep God's law. In Numbers chapter 15, we hear this. Speak to the people of Israel. Tell them to make tassels on the corners of their garments throughout their generations, and to put a cord of blue on the tassel of each corner. And it shall be a tassel for you to look at and remember all the commandments of the Lord to do them, not to follow after your own heart, your own eyes, which you are inclined to whore after. The problem 
that they were having here is they didn't just have tassels so that way that way they would remember to keep the law of God. That's something that God prescribed for the Old Testament saints. They like to have their fringes super long. See, their tassels were extra big. That way when people saw him, they could say, oh, that guy, he's remembering to keep the law of God. Look at him. I kind of think that I, I, I like to have a strange imagination. If, if, I, if I had a friend that was a Pharisee, his, his things were too long, I would just have him pace throughout the house and maybe the tassels could sweep the floor behind him as he went along. Who knows how this might work itself out. But the fact is, the problem was not the phylacteries, nor was it the tassels. It was the motivation of their heart behind it. You see, the problem was not what they were doing, it's why they were doing it. Jesus says they're making them extra wide and extra long so that everyone will look and say, look at that guy. He's religious. He's so pious. I wish I could be like him, devoting himself to the law of God. Christians, you know as well as I do that we can point fingers at the Pharisees all we want to, but if we don't guard our hearts and our hearts and our minds and put this attitude of the heart to death as soon as it rears its head, we'll be the exact same way. Exactly the same. Jesus tells us in Matthew 5:16. Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to you. No, to your Father who is in heaven. See, our good works do point to something, but it's not us. It's to the Father who saved us. Do you see the difference here? You see, God won't share His glory with anybody. That includes His children and His church. All things or for God's glory, or we're doing them for ourselves. Galatians 1.10, Paul says, For am I now seeking the approval of man or God? It's a pretty straight question. Do you think I'm trying to seek the approval of man, or do you think I'm trying to please God? Am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. Get it in your mind, Christian, big, plain, and straight, as Adrian Rogers used to say. You cannot serve God and man. You cannot please God and man. Your sole purpose on this earth is to share the gospel and glorify God. That's all. It's not to please man around you. But they not only, they not only did things to please man, though, oh, they love to be exalted. Look what Jesus said. And they love the place of honor and feasts and the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplace and being called rabbi by others. They love to be honored at the feasts and synagogues. And we know that there were certain seats in the synagogues that were more prominent, right? You had these more prominent positions. There were certain seats at feasts that were more prominent, especially if it was U-shaped, sort of the back of the U. The one in the middle would be the most prominent, but then it would work its way out farther and farther from the host and according to the authority or the position of power that they were in or how people viewed them. And the Pharisees and the scribes, they loved to sit in the position of power and authority. They loved the place of honor. They liked to walk in and people say, look at those tassels. Look at those phylacteries. You go to the front. They loved them. But not only that, they, they loved to be greeted in the marketplace. They, they loved when people walked up and said, oh, Pharisee, you guy. Scribe, you persons, look at you. So holy. Thank you for gracing us with your presence. Will you sign my Bible? No, they didn't say that. But anyway, but they would come up to them and they would greet them with honor and respect. You know what the Pharisees and the scribes did? Loved it. They loved it. And King Jesus wasn't fooled by it for a second. Notice that Jesus sees through their hypocrisy to the true nature of their heart. They loved to be called rabbi, literally lord or master. They loved it. When someone would come up and say, oh, Rabbi, Master of the Law, Lord Teacher, I've got a question. They loved it. This is, this is the, the sole purpose of why they're doing these things. They were men pleasers. They, they absolutely loved to be called Rabbi. Listen, this is a great temptation for all of us, no doubt. But I want to tell you something. This is something that church leaders have to be on guard and constant watch for at all times. Sunday school teachers, deacons, pastors, people are in, who are uh, viewed as, pe as elders in the church or people who would be wise in the church. This is something we have to constantly guard on, guard for. We all love to feel appreciated and validated. And on a certain level, listen, these things are not wrong. 
Paul tells all of the churches to honor their leaders, to you know, pay special attention even to those who are doing good things for Christ. They're not wrong on that level. But when our motivation or our pleasure for our service is found in how we are treated by others, we have completely missed the mark. We missed it. If that's the motivation of our hearts, we totally missed the mark. John MacArthur, I saw him just a few weeks ago at a conference. And uh, he, he came and he stood before everybody and he got a standing ovation, as I think he should. He is a wonderful teacher and uh, he's in his 80s and he's so faithful, right? And over, over the past year, he has been one of the, the, the sole voices of, of reason and, and courage in the Christian faith in California. And he came up and everybody cheered. I mean, everybody was a standing ovation. He's the only one that got one. He, a standing ovation. And, and he's a wonderful teacher. And he said, boy, he, this is what he said. He, well, there goes my eternal rewards. What a heart. You know, that, that should be the heart that all of us have. This is what he said uh, on these verses. He said, human teachers who faithfully proclaim and interpret God's word are to be appreciated, loved, and highly esteemed by those they serve. But they are never, they are not to seek honor, much less demand it or glory in it. They need to remember that they are neither the source of truth, which is God's word, nor the elimination, I mean the illumination of truth, which is God's spirit. Human teachers are but channels of communication. Guard your heart, Christian. Watch your motivations. Serve God, but not like them. Which leads to our second point of our two-point sermon. We are to be different. Don't be like them. Be different. It's pretty simple, isn't it? Don't be like them. Just be different. What does Jesus say in verse 8? You are not to be called rabbi. For you have one teacher. You're all brothers. And he means brothers and sisters in this context. Call no man your father on earth. For you have one father who is in heaven. Neither be called instructors. For you have one instructor, the Christ. The greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled. Whoever humbles himself will be exalted. It tells us first off, we're not to be called rabbi. No one is to be called master or lord or to be this person that is in this prominent position. We have one teacher through Christ, and through Christ, through the Holy Spirit. One teacher, Christ, through the Holy Spirit. God is our teacher. John 14, 25-26. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Now, I want to be careful here that I don't get fired after I get finished with the sermon. This does not mean that you're not allowed people to teach you. We read in Romans 12 this morning, as Brother Dustin read our scripture reading, that teacher's word, in fact, is in fact a gift from God, right? The Bible clearly says that the role of teacher is a gift that Jesus gives to the church. 1 Corinthians 12, 28, And God is appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, then teachers. Ephesians 4, 11, He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers, probably more like shepherd teachers, to equip the saints for the work of the mystery, for the uh, ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. But we're not to have one supreme teacher on the earth. There's no man on the earth that is supposed to be the supreme authority in the church. No man is to be called rabbi. Not in the way that they did it. But Christ. We're all brothers. This is what he says. For you have one teacher, and you're all brothers, brothers and sisters. Notice here there are a variety of roles and responsibilities, but there's no hierarchy of worth or importance. We are the ones that do that. Do you understand that in the church? We are the ones that do that. We are the ones that say, oh, well, the deacons are so important. Oh, the pastor is so important. Oh, the ones who are in positions of leadership on the finance team or whatever the case may be. Those are the ones that are so important. But me serving in the nursery or me serving with the youth or me serving with the children or me cleaning up outside, that's not important. Do you understand we're the ones doing that, not God? There's no hierarchy of, of worth or importance in the church of God. There's no hierarchy of worth or importance among God's children. He doesn't look at Cole and say, Oh, Cole is great. But him over there, he's nobody. We're all God's children. We're all co-heirs with Christ. Heirs according to the promise. Listen to 1 Corinthians 12, verses 4-7. through 7. There are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of service, but the same Lord. There are varieties of activities, 
For it is the same God who empowers them all and everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Notice that your gifting is a triune affair. It is the same Spirit that empowers all of them. There are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. Varieties of service, but the same Lord, Jesus Christ. There are varieties of activities, but it is the same God. Whatever gifts God has given you, it is a triune affair. And each one of us has gifts. Each of us is given a manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Everybody in the church is expected to serve because everybody in the church has been gifted. And nobody in the church is more important than another. What I mean by this, if you wanted to take it straight down to the, to the practical aspect, is the plumber who does what he does for the glory of God is just as pleasing to God as a preacher who shepherds the flock. And if you don't believe that, you've misunderstood grace. Whatever God calls you to do, do it for His glory. Do it because he, he has gifted you to do it. And don't put people in positions they shouldn't be. You're all brothers. We're one family. No one person is more important than another. We're all co-heirs with Christ. Heirs according to the promise. And then he says, Call no man your father. For you have one father who is in heaven. Don't, don't call someone father. This, on the surface would seem... Pretty simple, right? Don't call someone father. We have one father who is in heaven. But you think about it, you can't take this to the literal sense, or at least in the fullest sense that we might take it, because Paul calls himself a father, right? We have fathers on the earth that are our actual fathers. It does mean that we are not to exalt someone to a position that only God should fill. This is what Jesus means by not calling someone father. It's not exalting them to a position that only God should fill. There is only one source of our eternal life, one source of our eternal truth, and one source of our eternal joy, and that is our Heavenly Father. All things proceed from the Father. All things proceed from the Father. We don't have any other source of life. There is no other source but God. So we have no other Father but God. Now this doesn't mean you can't call somebody Father. 1 Corinthians 4, 14 and 15, and there's numerous instances. I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. But Paul is not saying here that he is the source of their eternal life. Or that he is the exalted one that only God can feel. The position that only God can feel. And it should give us pause when people in the church want to be referred to as Father. Jesus says, don't call anybody Father, for you have one Father, who is your Father in heaven. Neither be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Christ. This is basically the same thing that he's saying about being a teacher. We have one instructor, the Christ. But notice something about this. He is placing himself as the supreme authority on God's Word. The scribes and the Pharisees, they sit in Moses' seat. But Jesus is the only true instructor, the only true teacher. Now this would have been very scandalous. And I want to tell you, this would be ridiculous if he's not who he says he is. Again, this doesn't mean that we don't have instructors. It just means we are not to place ourselves as the supreme authority on the word and will of God. Any human on the earth that says, I am the supreme authority on the word and will of God is a liar. Jesus is. Despite or in spite of what position or role or how old or how young the person may be, anyone who comes and says, I am the authority on the word and will of God, he is a liar. Only Jesus is the instructor. Only Jesus is the supreme teacher. And God is our only father. And then he finishes this section by saying, the greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled. Whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Jesus said we are to live lives of humble service, accepting whatever God has for us for his glory and for our good. Because we are commanded to, right here and throughout the New Testament, and because we are imitating the example of our Lord Jesus Christ. Turn to Philippians 2. I want us to read verses 5 through 11. As we close. Philippians 2 verses 5 through 11. 
Holy Spirit of God says this, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, grasp, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You see, whenever we are humbling ourselves and allowing God to exalt us, we are following the example of our Lord Jesus Christ. So in closing, I want to ask you two questions with two options each. Have you come to understand that you are a sinner who deserves hell? Have you come to understand that you are a sinner who deserves hell? Here's your two options. If so... Have you come to the one who can remove the burden from your back? Or are you trying again and again to obey the law in an effort to earn God's favor and righteous standing before Him? Which is impossible. Be honest with yourself. Do you know you are a sinner? And if the answer to that is yes, then let me ask you these two options. Have you come to the only one who can remove your burden? Or are you trying again and again to obey the law in an effort to earn God's favor? and a righteous standing for them, which is impossible. The second question I want to ask you Christians, me as well, a question I've had to wrestle with all week, which group do you resemble more? Be honest with yourself. Which group do you resemble more? Are you living a life of hypocrisy, legalism, and man-pleasing? Are you doing what you're doing because you want everybody else to notice you? Are you doing what you're doing because you think somehow you are meriting God's favor? Or worse, are you telling people something and then not willing to do it yourself? Is that you? Do you look like the Pharisees? Because here in just a moment, or next week, or the week after next, I guess, Jesus is going to pronounce seven woes upon the scribes and Pharisees as hypocrites. Or... Are you humbly serving God for His glory and not your own as you seek to honor and exemplify the character of our Lord Jesus Christ? Do you look more like the Pharisees or do you look more like Jesus? The fact is, Jesus knows the answer. He knows the motivations of your heart. And truly, we'll never be able to do anything purely, at least 100% purely. But Christian, we have to guard our hearts. We can't be glory thieves. We can't seek to rob God's glory or to build our own kingdom on the earth. That's not our purpose. And we'll never find joy or satisfaction in that. We need to resemble King Jesus, who humbled himself and served for God's glory. He paid our redemption, yes? He removed the burden from our back. I think we should do it for him. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today, I would urge you to come to Him for salvation. Stop trying and failing. Stop. Stop placing the burden on your back. Come to Jesus. He'll remove the burden. He'll forgive your sins. He'll give you a new heart with new desires. He'll give you a new destiny. And He'll give you a new family. He'll give you a new father. Listen, if you don't know Jesus Christ today, you're playing a fool's game. If you were to die today outside of Christ then you would spend eternity in hell. No matter how good you try to be, you'll spend eternity in hell. If you do know Jesus Christ today, I pray this sermon has convicted you, but I pray that it's also compelled you to do good for the glory of God. Listen, drive a stake in the ground today. See, I can't change what happened back there. But from this day forward, I will follow Him. I will be a good servant. I will do what he commands me, not for my own glory, but for the glory of God. Wherever you are today, we're going to spend a moment, we're going to go into a time of prayer. I'm going to lead us in a time of prayer, and then we're going to have a time of response. Wherever you are today, I pray that you will lay yourself down as a living sacrifice upon the altar of God's grace.
I pray that you will ask God to renew you by the, or transform you by the renewing of your mind, just as we read this morning. I pray that you will do whatever God has compelled you, whatever God has convicted you to do. If you don't know Christ today, call out for salvation. If you don't know what that means, come and talk to me. But wherever you are today, let's lift our prayers before the throne of God. Our Father in heaven, we come to you today, Lord, thankful that you didn't send a Pharisee that you didn't send a scribe to lay more burdens upon our back, to tell us all of the things that we're doing wrong without any mention of your grace or your forgiveness in Christ Jesus. Father, we praise you that you sent your very own Son, who expects obedience of his people, not to be mistaken in that, he expects obedience of us. But he is a, a good and compassionate Savior, a great high priest, who intercedes for our, on our behalf, who absorbed your wrath for our sins so that we could be made new creations, who took our burden and threw it into the empty tomb. Father, I pray today for your people, for myself, that we would do things for your glory, not our own, that we would seek to please you, not man, and that we would live as citizens of the kingdom. Father, I pray for those who don't know you, they would get off the hamster wheel of legalism. That they would stop living their lives according to how well they are keeping your commands. And that they would just walk in fellowship with you. God, I pray that they will call out for salvation and be made new creations in Christ Jesus. Father, we love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen.